Hello, BookTube. I think, if I estimate correctly, today we are leaving the subterranean part of this penguin annex. We're now moving, I've been moving steadily upwards in shelves to the point where these are starting to get to <laughs> browsability. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I still haven't decided what I'm going to do with the non-browsable part, the, these, these shelves that we've been doing so far in this bit of the tour, because the these books are still going to be unbrowsable. <laughs> Even no matter what I put down there, they're going to be unbrowsable. I'm going to have to figure out what I want to do about that. But for now, I think this is the last Penguin Annex tour uh, that I will do sitting down. I, I The other shelves are at, are at shoulder level. So uh, let's enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> and then we'll just move on. I'll have to bring in some sort of seat here because I, I don't know about camera positioning. Otherwise, I'll figure it out. Uh, but I already know what the first three volumes on this shelf are because they're so big that I can easily tell nothing else in my collection is this big. I want to show them to you. Uh, I want to show them to you all at once. This is a joy. An absolute joy. This is Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. In, unabridged in three Penguin classics. These are... Uh, this is, first of all, the edition here is something that you absolutely have to have. Some of you may remember this uh, when it came out in a gigantic three-volume hardcover box set. Uh, this is the edition by David Wormsley, who's, it's just recent, relatively recent. It's in our lifetime uh, and as an edition of Gibbon, and it is the one to have. It's amazing. The introduction, the notes... Uh, the notes in Gibbon are a world on their own, because Gibbon, of course, famously put a huge amount of notes on his work, not just once, but twice. And then his uh, earliest editors also put enormous amounts of edits on his work. <laughs> and some of those edits are worth preserving. They're not just editorial factors of their time. They're worth preserving. And David Wormsley, oh, the job he does in this. This is a, a, a scholarly monument of our time, the, 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 this edition of one of the greatest works of history ever written. I <laughs> I know that Gibbon is intimidating. <laughs> I know that there's scarcely any work written in English that is more intimidating than The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, but uh, Gibbon is so worth it. <laughs> He's, I know that if, if BookTube just in general is a little wary of nonfiction, then even the nonfiction parts of BookTube are going to be staring open-mouthed at three 800-page volumes of one work. But nevertheless, when you experience the rolling prose of Gibbon, it's just... <laughs> it's unbelievable. And also, his history is... I know this is unfashionable to say, but his history is unsurpassed. His organizing theory about what may the factors that may have been behind the decline and fall of the Roman Empire is certainly arguable, but his research is unprecedented and unequaled since. You go deep into the, those aforementioned notes of his, and you find incredibly minor authors cited once or twice, cited in ways that there, there are sources in Gibbon that virtually no one else has been able to find, much less consult. It's an amazing work. <laughs> you could, and I don't mean it to sound like it's amazing in a pedantic way. You could remove the notes. You could remove any kind of critical apparatus whatsoever and just read it as an exercise in English prose, and you'd be well on your way. <laughs> so, so we start off with the Wormsley edition of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, and I don't see how this shelf can come anywhere close to equaling that. Let's see. What... <sighs> okay, we go from the sublime to the ridiculous. This is uh, Ra Ragged Dick by Horatio Alger. Ragged Dick, and I think there's two, maybe two other little novellas in here. He wrote, he wrote, he hit on a formula. Horatio Alger did. He he hit on a formula. Write a little book for boys and their parents about a boy who's on who's poor, in the slums, has nothing, destitute, but who has a dream and stars in his eyes and a pure soul. So, not only does he want to have more in life. But he's not willing to do anything to get it. There is, there, he has a clear line of right and wrong running through his soul. And Horatio Alger boys always manage to come out on top of the world without compromising that line. And uh, Alger wrote that story, and it struck a nerve. And he was pretty open about the fact that from then on, he was just going to keep writing that story. <laughs> if it works, why change it? And uh, 
as a result. His books are much of a muchness. <laughs> so, Ragged Dick, uh, you, when people ask me, is, you know, I hear the term Horatio Alger story all the time. Is Horatio Alger's actually worth reading? I always tell them, if you've read Ragged Dick, then you've read as much Horatio Alger as you absolutely need to. But if you read Ragged Dick and you actually like it, it gives you a lift, as it does. It does even for me. Uh, you've got plenty more to read, because <laughs> none of it changes. It's not like you're going to get to a midlife crisis with Horatio Alger. <laughs> oh, well, let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, I think we saw this on this channel. This is The Woman Who Had Two Navels uh, by Nick Joachim. This is uh, Tropical Gothic. This is, uh, they, you know, straddles the line between hor horror stories and gothic stories set in a tropical location. I read a bit of it, uh, and it definitely felt strange. It definitely felt like something new. It wasn't my kind of thing at all. Uh, and I, I think I wandered away from it. Uh, but, uh, not, not inimically. I, I'm, I just, I will certainly go back to it. It's just, I, with a case like this, something like this, uh, I would probably need to be prompted to go back to this by encountering some echo in literature that would require me to come to the shelf and say, oh, well, you know, I have this book. I really should settle down with it, read the introduction, read the notes, read everything in it. Uh, and that will happen. That always does happen. Uh, is I have a, I have a very wide ranging and adventurous reading life. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Okay. This next one is, uh, wow. Okay. Uh, this is an old penguin classic mass market of the new Testament with no, how are you going to blurb the New Testament? What are you, what are you going to say? <laughs> the author's best work? <laughs> so this is, this is, I think, the Richmond Lattimore translation of the New Testament. Uh, and just that. That's all it is. That's just that in notes. In a mass market. And a mass market that has somehow found its way into all of these trades. That's That's got to be rare. Uh, but then again, I haven't proven a very uh, big expert on what's actually on these shelves, have I? So, oh my. Oh, goodness gracious. All right. Here's the... the uh, penguin copy of the Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, his his uh, allegedly groundbreaking novel that is allegedly readable and allegedly really good. <laughs> and I have two shelves up over my head for Victorian era writers. He should be there. So, and and you know, sitting here and doing this shelf tour with you, I am not one hundred percent sure that there isn't a copy of the Moonstone up there. So this could be a double, which is why, as I mentioned, I'm putting these books uh, in a pile on the floor as I pull them off the shelf. I'm not putting them back on the shelf because I don't want to just, out of laziness or, or an, an eagerness to clear the floor, I don't want to replicate errors. So I'm, I'm putting these all here, and then when they're done, I will sort all the way through them and figure out what I want to do with this bookcase. Uh, what is this next one? Oh, another Penguin copy of Dracula. I know that I have other Draculas in Penguin other editions, maybe other introductions, other cover art. I know that I have plenty of those, and that in itself is inexcusable. <laughs> you know, much as I might like somebody's introductory essay, it's not worth keeping a book for. You, I only need one Penguin Classic of Dracula, <laughs> especially since I have like three or four other editions of Dracula that aren't Penguin Classics, so we'll put it on the pile for now and be merciless when the time comes. Oh, look at that. Look at Desiger, the Marsh Arabs. This is a... a uh, it's got illustrations. I think we might have seen this. This is, uh, I think we might, I might have followed this on this channel. This is, or, or a, a second copy of it, if there's a second copy of it somewhere. This is a, just his, his incredibly detailed and moving portrait of a vanished world, a vanished people, a uh, vanished culture. Really, really good. Uh, what is next here? Oh, 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 okay. All right. One more time. I mentioned in these tours, I will continue to mention in these tours, that Penguin has a remit. They always have had a remit. And that is uh, affordable and good uh, reprints of classics. But they also do original introductions, or, and uh, they do original anthologies. Where they, uh, some, edit, they will, some editor will be tasked with bringing together a bunch of stuff. And some of those original anthologies are incredibly good. Uh, I've come to, to look on them as just a fully equal branch of Penguin and every bit as adorable as, as the, you know, the, the classics. And this is one of them. This is a great one. <laughs> look at this. This is the portable 19th century African American women writers. And there they all are. Those are the stars of the show. This is a, an echo of the, the old Viking portable volumes. Penguin, Penguin Viking used to do a great line of books. The 
called the portable library, the portable Tennyson, the portable Victorian reader, the portable Freud. Some of them were bestsellers. The portable Faulkner was a bestseller. Uh, and some of them were hardly known at all. The portable Malcolm Cowley is one that I go back to over and over again, but it, you'll never see them again. And Penguin still occasionally does a portable volume, just as a nod to that old library, I think. And this... These women are amazing. They're amazing wordsmiths. And it's rendered all the, the more amazing when you think that they had the weight of the world in terms of obstacles on their shoulders. Every one of them. Every one of the women on this cover is stronger than any man. Because they had the weight of the world on their shoulders. Not only were they black in an America that considered blacks to be, you know, slaves even in even after the civil war it was still there was still segregation and jim crow it was still it was still the mother of all burdens but on top of that they were women so in many cases in many parts of the country when these women were writing it, the odds against a, a a young black girl with an incredibly good mind getting an education were astronomical much less getting an opportunity to write, swaying an audience, growing eloquent, growing forceful in your beliefs. It's just, I read this book, I loved it. I loved that it introduced me to a lot of writers I didn't know. And I loved that this book is a portrait in courage like you wouldn't believe. Every word these women wrote was an act of courage. It's just, <laughs> I cannot recommend it strongly enough as an original anthology that Penguin makes. Uh, I think I reviewed it. I, I, I've been a little remiss in, in linking reviews. I will, if I remember, I will, I will uh, link reviews to everything in here. Uh, <laughs> okay, George Sand, one tiny, tiny sliver of her of her total writing output. Uh, this this is just one. I don't think I have any other George Sand, and it, it you could go on forever. This this would be an entire shelf on its own if anybody did it. Nobody does. I don't think she's in print anymore at all in English. And even if she were, I don't think anybody's ever done. Of course, nobody's ever collected book reviews. My familiar refrain. Nobody's ever gone and found all the literary criticism that she's done. Not in English. And I don't think there's ever been in English a good volume of her letters. She was a great letter writer. Uh, really funny. And... Uh, and uh, <sighs> Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I, I could always look around. I'm glad to have this volume, although what it's doing here, I don't know. That's a familiar refrain. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, talk about a lost chestnut. This is Anthony Hope, The Prisoner of Zenda, <laughs> and then this, the sequel. But The Prisoner of Zenda is the real, the real marquee attraction. Look at that. <laughs> look at that cover. Douglas Fairbanks. <laughs> I, I just a... A classic adventure story about a man who masquerades as a king. Just, I don't know. I actually don't know. Those of you, most of you who watch BookTube are uh, are very young, like me. You were in your 20s. And so you may not be familiar with Prisoner of Zender. You may never have encountered it. Once upon a time, for a long time, it was the book. It was, it was an adventure classic that everyone knew. And they didn't just know the title. They knew, they knew the details of the story. And it would come up in conversation. It was just it was just assumed for probably sixty years. It was just assumed that you had read the Prisoner of Zenda, and now <laughs> it'd be amazing if you meet somebody who's even heard of it. And that's a shame because it it holds up well. It, I read it when I got uh, when I found this this paperback. I don't remember if Penguin sent this to me or not, but I reread it uh, when I got this and it, and was amazed at how well it holds up. So a classic adventure story again. It should be somewhere else in this collection, uh, but we'll, we'll sort that out. Uh, okay. A little more Balzac. Slowly but surely in this, in this annex tour, I am realizing how much Balzac I have. I, I have, uh, it should all be, and needless to say, his novels should all be together, but I have more than I thought I did. Uh, and uh, you know, this tour has just started. There's tons more penguins here. So it's good that I'm putting, I'm putting these all on a pile on the floor, even though this little book room, it has a tiny little bed, it is surrounded by bookshelves. There is very little room. It has one big window. And uh, I decided a long time ago that the only way to make this space work is to treat it like a cabin on a sailing vessel. And uh, those of you who may, might know what I'm talking about, there probably aren't many of you who've ever sailed, uh, ever spent a night on a sailing vessel, much less a long time. But if you have a, a small, a very small, a broom closet small cabin on a sailing vessel, and that's your personal space... It has to be clean all the time. 
basically. Everything has to be pulling its weight, ship shape. Everything has to be strapped down and ready. There can't be, the, the you know, if, uh, if you're watching this video now and you turn your eye to that certain corner of your room, you will see a pile of garbage, a pile of stuff that you're meaning to clean out, a pile of clothes that you're meaning to sort to the laundry or, or onto your shelves, a pile of books that you just haven't figured out what to do with. That's the luxury of a stationary place to live. You don't have that luxury if you have a tiny cabin on a vessel at sea. So, And I decided a long time ago that the way to handle this room is to treat it that way. So, although there are, there is, of course, since this is a stationary place to live, there will always be a little, a little pieces of junk here and there. But my, my mental goal, my mental rule, every time I leave this room, is never leave the room empty-handed. Always take something out. Because you can guarantee you're always going to be taking something in. Uh, so it feels a little a little retrograde to have a pile of books on the floor. But I am going to deal with it. As soon as this tour is over, I'm going to deal with this, this pile and make sure I know what these books are. Am I keeping them? Am I getting rid of them? Or do they belong somewhere else? Etc. Et uh, so uh, let's see here. Oh my God! First, Horatio Alger. Now Sherwood Anderson, uh, Weinsberg, Ohio. So a lot of the a lot of the books on this particular shelf, Horatio Alger, Prisoner of Zenda, Sherwood Anderson. A lot of these people are either totally forgotten or well on their way. I think Sherwood Anderson is mostly remembered now because he's taught in schools. I don't think anybody reads him for entertainment anymore. And that also would have been amazing. <laughs> Weinsberg, O'Hara, Dodsmith, I, nobody, I don't think anybody reads him. I don't think anybody knows his works. You certainly, if you're, at a, if you're in a retail bookstore, no one other than a student will ever come in and ask for him. Uh, and that's, that's a shame. These are, they strike out on territory of their own. They are quite good. Uh, I'm glad there's a Penguin Classic, although I can't imagine it ever happening again. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay, all right. This is a... Uh, the Comedians by Graham Greene, one of the uh, series of somewhat attractive reprints that they did. They got high-powered people to do the introductions to all of them. It's Paul Thoreau that does this one, but there you've got a whole bunch of names that you would recognize that do all the others. I don't have the whole set, I don't think, unless they're scattered all over the place. I didn't know that I had the Comedians. Uh, I've never read the Comedians in this Penguin Classic. I've never read this edition, and I've never read the Paul Thoreau introduction. Didn't know I had it until I just encountered it now which is not the way a bookshelf should be. So so we will, I will fix that. Uh, then we're down to this last one here. What is this last one? Oh, goodness gracious. Talk about a forgotten chestnut, quite literally. <laughs> this is the Civil War Diary of Mary Chestnut, uh, She where she told all her stories. And Penguin came out with a Penguin. This, this was in the, the early 2000s, I think. Uh, when did this one come out? No, 2011. Uh, this edition came out in 2011. This is abridged, of course. Some of you may remember if you've been in bookstores or your library. There's an enormous, uh, much less abridged version of her, of her diaries. As far as I'm concerned, this isn't abridged enough. <laughs> she A little of it goes a long way. And, you know, naturally, uh, speaking from the heart of, from the birthplace of American independence and from the heart of the abolitionist movement, <sighs> It gets a little tiresome for me to hear, uh, for me to read entry after entry of uh, uh, a southern rebel getting all lachrymose because her comfortable life is being interrupted by a war to free her property. <laughs> I, I, I may be one of the only people in the world who doesn't like Mary Chestnut's diaries, not because they're artless or galumphing, but because I don't like her. Uh, I think I wrote about this. If I did, I will try and find it. Uh, but anyway, there you go. That is this last shelf of of me being in puppy territory for this bookshelf tour. I the the I'm going to continue with this bookshelf all the way to the ceiling. But uh, the the uh, dark corner business here is over. Frida jumping on me here is over. And and uh, I'm glad that I did it. But oh god, the temptation. This is such a temptation to just start diving in and rereading, and I cannot do that. I absolutely, I cannot do that. I am due uh, sometime, uh, sometime soon, probably sometime this decade. I am due to reread Gibbon entirely, and I will do it in these volumes. But I, but not now. <laughs> This this week has been so incredibly monstrous for writing obligations that I'm I'm not even going to think about it. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. We'll we'll wrap this up for now. But I, I'm I am sorry there there were no videos yesterday. I posted 
a bookshelf tour here from this penguin shelf, but it was one that I'd made the day before and forgot to post. And a lucky thing, too, because if I hadn't forgotten to post it, if I'd posted it the day before, there wouldn't have been anything yesterday. And you'd all be going into twitchy Steve withdrawals. <laughs> Sorry about that. The day's deadlines just caught up with me completely. But there'll be more of me today. Don't you worry. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.